outside of Malaysia, the name one of Andy might be unfamiliar. However, the figure is so well known to Malaysia that we just hear on the name can make sure run down people's spine. How is this popular singer can change her career to a shaman and even involved in one of the biggest premeditated murder cases in Malaysia? Monofendi was born with the name Mazina bin Ismail on January 1, 1956 in Kanga, Perlis, Malaysia. Mona had aspired to be a singer since she was a child. In 1978, her dream came true. With her debut album, Diana Wan, she was able to break into the music industry and using the name Monofendi as her stage name. The album is widely regarded as commercial success. Monofendi's name became well known among Malaysians as a result of her single, Kunyanyikan Lagu Ini. However, her career faded over time because she was unable to compete with more talented newcomer singers. As a result, Mona changed her profession to shaman together with her husband, Afandi. After becoming a shaman, Mona Fendi established a practice of alternative and supernatural medicine. Mona Fendi's patients are numerous and they all claim to be pleased with the result they receive after visiting Mona Fendi. This piqued the interest of Malaysian politician named Dato Mazlan Idris in visiting Mona's practice in Pahang in July 1993. The former member of State Legislative Assembly, Dun Obatu Alam Pahang, also requests Mona to improve his political career. Mazlan has been a client of the well-known paranormal duo in the area for the past few months. Mona told Mazlan that she can multiply any amount of money that he brought in a special ritual. This got Mazlan interested and took out 300,000 ringgit from a bank in Kuala Lumpur. Mazlan is well-known in the political world for his ambition. He is tempted by Mona offer of doubling money in order to satisfy his desire for power. Even though he is wealthy, he need money to stay in politics. In July 3, 1993, as planned, money multiplying ritual will take place. Mazlan arrived at Mona Fendi house shortly before 10 p.m. local time. Mona is waiting with his husband, Muhammad Nur Afandi Abdul Rahman, and their assistant Jeremy Hassan. Jeremy was present at the time and assisted in the preparation of all the necessities for the ritual of the money multiplication. Then he invited Mazlan into the room where the flower bar ritual would take place. The room was small, only accommodating four people. There is a bathroom as well as a water outlet. While looking for a chair, Mazlan inquired as to where he should sit. Mona explained that this ritual is performed lying on the floor with the head up rather than sitting. Mazlan also followed the instruction. He sat down on the thick blanket Jeremy had spread out in front of him. His head was instructed to be more upright when looking up. It was a position to accept money, which Mona predicted would fall from the sky at any moment. Mazlan is told to close his eyes by Mona. Mazlan then closed his eyes without any doubt. Then Afandi squinted at Jeremy, signaling. Jeremy obeyed by catching the eye signal. He took the ritual tool that had been prepared, a sharp axe that had recently been sharpened. Afandi gave the go ahead, then the axe pierced Mazlan's neck once. His body immediately began to shake. Jeremy swung his axe two more times. Severing Mazlan's neck, blood was puring profusely from the wound, seeping into the thick blanket beneath. That night, Mazlan was died on the spot. Jeremy worked tirelessly that night to dismember Mazlan's body into 18 pieces, then placed the human body parts in the bucket. Mona informed Jeremy that she and Afandi would be going to Kuala Lumpur while giving Jeremy 180 ringgit. Jeremy was left alone that night to bury Mazlan's body part. Jeremy had just finished his tasks in the early hours of the morning. Mazlan was buried in a large hole dug a week before around Mona's house. After that, the excavation was covered with cement. Mona and Afandi found themselves suddenly wealthy. They went shopping sprees the day after killing Mazlan. A car, cell phones, and jewelry worth to 160,000 ringgit were purchased in an instant. Mona also underwent plastic surgery to tighten her skin, which cost 13,000 ringgit in total. Afandi was blinded by the money as well. He also kept spending the money, and within 10 days, the 300,000 ringgit was gone. When they spent the illegal money, they had no recollection of Mazlan. Meanwhile, Mazlan's relative became suspicious a few days after he went missing. It appears impossible that the father of two children who worked so hard could be gone for days without communication. Furthermore, he was absent from an important meeting in Rao. Dr. Zuki Kamaluddin, his colleague Adun in Benta, finally reported it to the police. The report contains, as well as the possibility of missing or kidnapped people, he hasn't attended an official meeting since July 3, 1993. 
Police also began to track Mazlan's frequent and most recent visit to various locations. Mazlan is known to pay frequent visit to the home of the pair of shaman. The police arrived at the mother's house right away. When the cops arrived, the house was empty. That's when the cop discovered Mona and Effendi didn't live alone, but with Jeremy, Mona's assistant. It didn't take long for cop to track Jeremy down because he'd been arrested in a drug case on July 13, 1993. Jeremy told the police about Mona and Effendi's departure to Kuala Lumpur on July 1993. Nonetheless, he covered up their heinous behavior. The cops were not pleased. The home of Mona and Effendi was later searched. In the house, there were video recordings, photos album and Mazlan certificate. Police are becoming increasingly convinced that Mazlan disappearance is inextricably linked to this trio. According to several witnesses, Mazlan was seen leaving Huludong village with Mona and Afendi in Mazlan car. The car was later searched but failed to be found. Finally, the police issued a public notice in the newspaper requesting that anyone who saw the car immediately report it. A few days later, Salesman admitted to conducting a transaction in which he bought and sold the vehicle in the newspaper. Mazlan cars are sold in Pudu, Kuala Lumpur by none others than Mona and Afandi. Police officers rushed to the scene. Soon after, Mona and Afandi were apprehended in Wangsa Maju, Kuala Lumpur. When confronted by police, Mona and Afandi denied the claim. They admitted they had no idea where Mazlan had gone. But it didn't take long for them to be imprisoned because Jeremy finally admitted the heinous murder. Jeremy showed where Mazlan's body was buried on July 23, 1993. The gravel pit dug by Jeremy was then demolished. Mazlan's body was discovered in a piece that were no longer in good condition. Axes and machetes used to kill Mazlan were also discovered in the house. Mona and Effendi should be unable to flee any longer. Despite their calm demeanor, the two continued to fight. Effendi claimed that it was Jeremy who entered the room and slit Mazlan's neck, claimed that he was doing it unconsciously, as if he was hypnotized. Mona and Effendi confession, however, is contradicted by the fact that they did instructed Jeremy to dig a hole a week before the flower bird ritual. Jeremy also stated that Mona and Effendi sharpened their machetes prior to the incident. Furthermore, in Mazlan's case, despite the fact that Mona and Effendi did not cut Mazlan's neck, both were proven to be present at the scene at the time. As a result, in Malaysian law, their actions are classified as premeditated murder. That is, even if Jeremy beheaded Mazlan, Mona and Effendi must be held accountable as well because they planned to kill together. On February 9, 1995, the verdict was read aloud. They were all found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. Strangely, Mona and Effendi are smiling when they're listening to the decision of the court, especially Mona who doesn't appear to want to look like a prisoner. Every time a conference was held, she must have appeared cheerful, as if she felt no remorse for his heinous act. She smiled earnestly even posing for the camera of the journalist. She appears to be enjoying the camera spotlight, much like a celebrity posing for a fans. Unlike the majority of the other inmates, always look glamorous during the trial. The clothes at every conference are expensive and changeable. Mona really the attention lavish on her. Mona's desire to become a celebrity does not appear to have faded on stage or even in the court trial. In 1999, the killer threw a field and appeal in court but it was denied. The death penalty is still on the table. The execution date was set for November 2, 2001. According to prison officials, the few days before Mona was hanged, she frequently said, I will not die. Mona repeated the sentence with a mysterious smile. Mona and Effendi were allowed to meet with all of their family members eight hours before the execution. Mona and Effendi are said to have spent their final days advising their children. Many prison officials were taken aback by their calmness prior to the execution. Furthermore, many people are still skeptical of Mona's claims when she says that she will not die. Many people associate it with a mystical sight because she was a shaman. The gallows were ready for the killer trio execution on Friday morning. The trio were then handcuffed and required to wear head coverings. A small number of prison guards, officers, and doctors were present during the execution. The three were escorted to the gallows. They were instructed to climb on their designated footrest. A rope is wrapped around their neck. When footrest was pulled at 5.59 am, all three fell with their necks dangling. Mona dies at the age of 45, Afendi at the age of 44, and Jeremy at the age of 31. The three bodies were left hanging on the gallows for an hour before being removed for autopsy. 
Mona and Effendi were led to Guri at one of the cemetery in Kajang that morning as well. Meanwhile, Jeremy was returned to his hometown in Klang and buried in Teluk Gong. Until today, the name Mona Fendi still lingers and well known by Malaysian people. Perhaps, this is what she meant when she said, I will not die.